Good afternoon to our viewers in Germany and good morning to our viewers in the United States. I'm Steve Sokol, the president of the American Council on Germany, and I'd like to welcome you to our weekly Café Pause. Each week we check in with a Berlin-based journalist to talk about the stories shaping the headlines, and today I'm delighted to welcome Matthew Karnichnik. He is the chief European correspondent for Politico, and he's based in Berlin. Matt, it is great to see you. Thanks for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me again, Steve. I'm I'm really looking forward to our conversation because I feel, as always when we get together, there's a lot to talk about. And I thought we could maybe start by getting your take on the the political mood in in Berlin and and in Germany more broadly at the moment. Sort of what's what's the atmosphere like right now? Well, I think for for a lot of people at the moment, there is some relief, I would say, that the coalition came down and made a decision on on tanks, which had had really kind of poisoned the atmosphere for 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 several weeks. And Schultz was pretty isolated in in, in the end on on this question, not just with, within sort of the political landscape in general, but also within his own coalition, as you know. So I think it was definitely a a positive sign for everybody that at least there there was a decision and it was the decision that I think most people had had been hoping for um although you know now um it, it feels a little bit like they're they're back into the same uh type of debate about the fighter jets but my own view is that I I, I think that is more of a sideshow because um you know, on, on the question of jets, Germany isn't really that important. And, and it had this outsized importance and has an outside importance on the outsized importance on the question of tanks, because um, as the manufacturer of the uh, Leopard tanks, its approval was necessary in order for, for other countries to, to, to send tanks. I think this is often sort of misunderstood generally in the United States, that it wasn't so much about Germany sending the tanks itself as it was about letting others, and there are thousands of these tanks in Europe, um, giving others the uh, the re-export approval for them, because that really could be, you know, a, a game changer for, 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 for Ukraine, although Germany itself, I guess, is sending 15 as well, which is, which is welcome, but it's, it's not really only about the, the, the German tanks itself. So I think Overall, um, I would say the mood has calmed down somewhat, but you know um, there's still a lot of eyes on what's happening in in Ukraine. Obviously, there's a lot of nervousness, I would say, uh, up in Berlin about what this coming offensive will mean and how it will, um, you know, pressure Germany again to to do more. But uh, for the moment, I would say that there is a bit of a bit of relief. So a couple of points I'd maybe like to to pick up on. I mean, one is, you know, obviously the the tank debate has been a focus of attention, a lot of attention in in recent weeks. And um from some of the polling that I was seeing, it it seemed pretty divided in terms of how the public viewed this. Um of about 50% being in favor, um about 50% being against. Of course, this is a little bit <clears throat> different from more than 70% of the the public in Germany um <clears throat> supporting German support of Ukraine. So it has been a, a divisive issue. And I guess the you know the the part two to it that you alluded to over fighter jets has, as you say, much less to do with Germany's ability to actually supply fighter jets, but much more um this sort of gnarly question of allowing um weapons that used to be German and have now been either sold or passed on to other European countries to be used. Because I think the, the issue with the fighter jets is the, the MiG jets that the Poles now own that used to be um, owned by the, the GDR um, and used in the GDR military. That one of the questions is whether those, those fighter jets couldn't be provided to Ukraine. But of course, first Berlin would have to sign off on that. 
Right. And I mean, we've kind of come full circle on, on that debate, to be honest, because this is something that came up last spring um, already at towards the beginning of the of the war. And then there was this question, well, if you give them MIGs, how are you going to transfer the MIGs to them and the polls? Because you know, there's all kinds of international law around this. And, um, you know, at one point they talked about handing them over to the Ukrainians at, at Ramstein and uh, anyway, I, I I don't think that the, the 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 question of the fighter jets will ultimately be be decided in Berlin. But I think the significance of this discussion, at least for me, is that it shows again that all of the the German internal debate about these issues has left the impression domestically and I think internationally to a degree that that you know Germany has a sort of outsized importance here. Uh, when it comes to the war in Ukraine and deciding how how the West acts, um, and I, I think that's exaggerated. You know, I think there is this this sense for our, our German speakers in the group of Seitzstuberstadt. So I think that which is sort of you know overstating your own importance. Um, and you know, as I said before, I think that's true on the text. I don't think it's true on other issues. The United States has so far delivered uh, about thirty billion dollars in military aid. Germany has. Has delivered about two and a half billion. Uh, so you can really see this huge gulf there. And the Germans are always saying, well, we're number three, maybe number two now, um, around the, the same level as the UK. But I mean, there's sort of an ocean between what the US has done and, and what the Germans done. So uh ha- have done. But it, you know, these issues are discussed much more intensively here than they are in the United States. And you could see that, you know, again on the tank decision where uh Biden basically uh Depending how you look on it, he either he either folded or he called Schultz's bluff and said, "Okay, well, we'll send 30 Abrams um, and now you don't have any excuses left. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was without any real debate in, in, in the United States. I mean, he 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 made that decision against the advice of the Pentagon. Um, but, you know, it didn't cost him and I don't think it will cost him um, any 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 political capital, where as you know, as we've all uh, seeing these these uh, decisions in, in in Germany for better or worse uh, drag on and on and on and and just never seem to to really die. But uh, just just quickly on the public opinion, I mean you're you're right. It still is divided. I think there is a slight majority now in favor of sending tanks. Um, but you know, as you say, you know the fact that seventy percent of Germans want to help Ukraine that's obviously a positive thing. That difference there sort of says to me that the political class, in particular the the SPD, has has not done a good enough job of making the argument to the German public as to why this is necessary. And um, you know, I think that is something that a lot of people. Uh, on both sides of the political divide agreed on in terms of Schultz's communication uh, over the last uh, couple of months on the tank issue is that he he just didn't really sort of explain to people what his motivations were. Um, He's tried to do that a little bit now after the decision was made, but I I think that's why more people are not in favor of of sending tanks because they they haven't really been convinced um, as as to why to why it's necessary. So, I mean, I think this issue of, of Schultz's communication style um, is an important one, and it's undoubtedly one that we'll all be watching um, in the, the months and years to come and sort of analyzing as we go along. Um, <clears throat> tied to that, you know, you talked a little bit about the fact that that Biden's decision to deliver um, Abrams tanks did not cost him much political capital. I'm sort of wondering what political price Scholz paid for the delay, but also now for saying yes to allowing um, tanks to to go to to Ukraine. I mean, obviously that ties in with communication a little bit, but how how are people sort of responding um, and what what price do you think he paid in that process? I, I think the price, to be honest, that he paid is probably more outside of Germany than inside of Germany. Um, I mean, there are tensions in the in, in in the coalition, but I think I think Germans generally, and we've seen this in the past, sort of uh, approve of his. You know, some people would say plotting; other people would say sort of sober uh, evaluation uh, on on these on these issues and not being rushed in into a decision. Um, you know, the counter argument is that it's cost lives in 
in Ukraine. Um, they're losing, you know, hundreds of soldiers every day, in, in part because they don't have the proper armor. And 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 there is a pattern here of saying no uh, at the beginning and then ultimately uh, folding. And we saw this on the infantry fighting vehicles, the the so-called martyrs, mm -hmm. where Ukraine asked in March of last year for a license to buy a hundred of these of these vehicles, which uh, Rhine Metal, the manufacturer, um, had available. These weren't uh, these aren't martyrs that the Bundeswehr was using. These had been decommissioned and would be refurbished. And uh, Rhine Metal offered to sell them to Ukraine, but needed the position the the permission of the government, which uh, Schultz never gave. Um, and ultimately, they're now getting 40 of these martyrs instead of the 100, and it's taken a year. So I think you can see that example that this is just, you know, and Ukrainian soldiers are being driven around in the front um, in, in pickup trucks and are, are, have been completely exposed at, at, as a result. Um, so, you know, I, 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 but I, I think that's left a lot of um, frustration internationally, especially within NATO over over Germany's uh, handling of this effort. Certainly, if you talk to the Poles, you know, you're, you're not going to hear um, a, a lot of enthusiasm for the way Germany has handled itself or or the Baltic states. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, even in, in, you know, people I talk to in, in, in the U.S. are, are also not um, particularly excited about the way the, the, the Germans have, have dragged their feet. But as I say, domestically, I think he, uh, he, he, fares, he fares better. Obviously, the, the CDU supporters are, are not big fans, but they wouldn't, they wouldn't be anyway. Um, but within the SPD, and I, I think probably even farther to the left, um, you know, this is one of the issues, surprisingly, where he, he gets pretty, pretty high marks. It's his handling of, of, of Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, talking a little bit about some of the the tensions within sort of the German political field, I mean, I'd like to come back to the the CDU in a little bit. But first, um, I'd like to to maybe talk a little bit about the coalition, because um, there have been a number of press reports in the last couple of days um, over the weekend about some real tensions between Scholz and Foreign Minister Annalena Baerbock. Um, over some of the things that she has said about whether or not Germany is in a war with Russia. Um, <coughs> he has has really, you know, come out clearly and said, um, and I think she has as well, that um, there there will not be a war between between NATO and, and Russia. Um, can you talk a little bit about some of the, the tensions within the coalition that you're observing? Yeah, I think this is really a, a key question, and, and it helps to, to look back a little bit at both of their histories, in particular uh, Schultz's, which I, I, I tried to do last week in a piece that kind of explored a, a bit of his history uh, during during the Cold War. And I, I think that if you if you understand where where Schultz's kind of head was during during the Cold War, it helps a lot to understand what he's what he's doing right now. I think this whole idea about this is all, you know, the German reluctance is all tied to World War II and so forth. Um, I, I think that's a bit of a, a bit of a myth. I think it has much more to do with, with the Cold War and, and this idea that, you know, ultimately engaging the Russians, keeping the lines open with them, um, you know, was, was good for peace. It was good for, for, for Germany ultimately led to reunification and so forth. So he's very kind of you know, much a believer in in this Ostpolitik idea, which we know, and which obviously some would say, well, led to this kind of fiasco with Nord Stream two, and and this belief that you know Germany should stay engaged there. But the other part of that equation during the Cold War, of course, was the arms race, which he was also very active in, in terms of the the debates then, and he was, um, you know, a a the deputy leader of or a deputy leader of the Yuzos of the Young uh, Social Democrats in the 1980s, and he organized. Many of the protests that were held then um, against the stationing of Pershing missiles in 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 Europe in in, in Germany, which is something that um, Reagan decided to do um, after the Soviets uh, did so. And um, you know, the younger people on the call might not remember this, but these were extremely intense uh, protests that uh, erupted in West Germany at the time. Um, you know, really kind of 
um, was the the motivation, I think, for a whole generation of of, of uh, German politicians to go into politics, uh, and maybe even in, in including Schultz. And they were anti NATO. They were pretty uh, negative towards the United States at the time. And and he made you know multiple trips to the DDR at the time, um, also to to go and visit uh, some of the leaders, including Egon Krenz, who later became mm-hmm. uh, the leader of, of of the GDR. So I think this this belief that you know, things could spin out of control here, um, that there could be a nuclear war. Um, this is always the counter argument that you hear in Germany. And when 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 you when you watch the news and, you know, they'll talk to people on the street, there was a demonstration over the weekend, you know, especially the older generation that lived through that. This is sort of where they are. And I think this is very much in, in his mind, this idea of escalation, you always hear this, you know, we don't want to escalate. Well, what, what's the problem with escalation? Obviously, escalation could lead to a nuclear war. And that's also the case, I think, with uh, Rolf Mützenich, who's the head of the SPD parliamentary group, a very influential figure in, in the SPD, um, you know, who has been kind of pushing the brakes also since since the very, very beginning. I mean, it, it just, just uh, you know, I don't know, I guess uh, less than a year ago, um, Mutsunik still wanted the U.S. to to remove all of its nuclear warheads uh, from Germany. You know, he'd been trying trying for years to get the U.S. to withdraw uh, withdraw all of its nukes. Um, I suspect he might have a different view today, but I mean, it just shows you where where these people are coming from. And I think for Baerbock, who obviously is a different generation, um, you know, who came up in the Greens after the decision uh, regarding Kosovo. And um, you know, is much more comfortable with um, Germany, you know, helping others using military power uh, where, where necessary. You really see, you really see the difference here. And and the Greens, it has to be said. I mean, from if you have the view that that the West should defend Ukraine, the Greens have been on the right side of history uh, since the beginning on this. And I think the the SPD, um, because of its history and because of you know all of these lingering worries about uh, provoking Russia and uh, you know triggering nuclear holocaust, um, you know have have been a little bit or you know significantly more cautious and and that's still playing out within within the coalition Mm -hmm. so so related to this i mean you've been um in some of your writing fairly fairly critical of the the titan venda and sort of how quickly or not character for me um yes exactly um how how sort of slowly things have progressed um with with the new (coughs) defense minister pistorius do you think things might move forward more quickly in some of the key areas that Chancellor Scholz outlined in his Zeit and Venda speech nearly a year ago? Um, well, uh, you know, I mean, I also think, as you know, that the Zeit and Venda is basically a mirage. It's a controversial uh, opinion, but um, 100 billion in, in the grander scheme of things just isn't isn't really that much. Um, and, you know, as, as the... Um, the, the defense ministry has pointed out now they're not going to be able to buy as much as they originally intended because of inflation. So they've already sort of, I think, had to pare it back by about about 10 percent. And I think it's just a, you know, there's something in the, uh, you know, German mentality now that, uh, you know, they, they, they just they, they don't want to spend they want to spend as little as necessary, as little as they can get away with on defense. And, and if you look at the debate around the the so-called uh, Sondervermögen, the special fund that they set up to kind of recapitalize the Bundeswehr, you know, that was also it was it was, uh, you know, got pretty, pretty heated um, over spending 100 billion to defend the country. Um, a couple of months later, they had another debate about spending 200 billion to subsidize energy uh, bills. For people, which you could argue is necessary, but it's not exactly an investment in the country's uh, future, uh, much less a, an investment in its uh, in its security. Um, and that just kind of sailed through. There wasn't any 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 real debate about that. And I think that's that's very uh, telling about you know how how people how people think about these things. Now, uh, if if you look at at the numbers. Um, you know, many people are saying now, well, the, 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 the 100 billion still won't get Germany up to uh, 2%. They're still going to miss that, that target, the 2% of GDP on defense spending. Um, 
And, you know, somebody told me, I think it was uh, uh, Francois Heisberg, uh, the, the analyst said, you know, this this hundred billion basically will will take Germany to where France has been over the past several years. So it's not as if you look at it in detail, it's it's it's, it's not as sort of extraordinary as I think they, they made it out to be initially. And, you know, that might be why that uh, the the ombudsman, ombudswoman uh, for the, the Bundeswehr, uh, Eva Hörgel, who was also a candidate to become um, a defense minister, has, has called for, send, for, for spending 300 billion instead of 100 mm-hmm. billion. Uh, which you know, she's from the SPD, but I guess you know like, her proposal didn't go very down very well in the chancellery, which might be one of the reasons uh, that she didn't get the job. I, you know, I, I, I wish Pistorius all the best. I, I really do. I hope that um, you know he he has more more luck than uh, than his predecessors. But it, it is uh, you know it is a very difficult job. He's gotten off to to a good start, um, but. You know, at, at at the end of the day, these decisions come down to what the chancellor is is willing to do, and you know that's true of the tanks, it's true yeah. of defense spending. So whoever is in in the defense ministry is 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 really you know constrained, um, and I don't get the impression that Schultz is somebody who um, you know wants to throw a lot of money more than he has to at the military because Germany has um, a lot of other issues uh, that it's that it's facing. And if we're honest, Germany has been in terms of its security in a very comfortable position for the last 70 plus years with the US basically guaranteeing its its security. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, in exchange for some German contribution, but you know it clearly hasn't been what what the U.S. has wanted, and it's not just in the in the recent past. I think that goes back all the way to Eisenhower. The U.S. has always been demanding uh, that the Germans do more. So, um, you know, they're good at managing the U.S. on this. Clearly, with a little, you know, the little blip that we had in uh, during the Trump years, but otherwise, it's worked pretty well. So, I, I don't think that we're going to see them uh, deviate from 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 that from that strategy more than they have to. Matt, one of our, our viewers in Berlin is is curious um, how serious you think the tension is between Scholz and his chief advisor, um, Wolfgang Schmidt, on the one hand, and Annalena Babak um, on, on the other. Hmm. Well, I mean, I think it's it's pretty serious in the sense that uh, they don't see uh, eye to eye on things, and I, I, I don't think uh, that they are you know, communicating uh, very, very, very directly either. Um, otherwise, you know, you wouldn't, ha- excuse me, have the situation where, um, you know, Baerbock says in a, in a television interview with uh, with the French that the decision has basically been made to send uh, tanks to Ukraine several days before the decision was announced. And then the, the spokesman for the government uh, the next day on, 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 a, on that interview was on a Sunday and on, on a Monday, uh, the the spokesman for the government denies that there has been a decision. Um, it, it you know that that speaks volumes, and um, that's not the first time something like that has has happened. And it, and it's clear that you know she is much more um, aggressive on 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 these issues than than the chancellor is. But this is also a reminder of something I think we might have discussed before here, which is that. You know the, the 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 foreign ministry is a big stage, and it's it's a it's a great job to have because you get to fly around the world, and you know you look important and all the rest of it. But in in the German system, and not only in the German system, it's true of other European countries as well. You know the 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 prime minister's office or the chancellor's office in this case really you know has taken control of all of the important files when it comes to foreign policy. You saw this under Merkel. With Christoph Heuskin, and you're seeing it now uh, with with Schultz and Prudna and, and and Schmidt and so forth. That you know these these big decisions are being made in the Chancellery, and because the Foreign Ministry is typically or always um, occupied by a member of a different party in the coalition, um, they're, they're they're not really included in 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 the decision making to the degree 
one one would think. So, um, you know, uh, she, uh, her book has, I think, a, a very good reputation um, because of, of of her um strong rhetoric on 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 ukraine um also in germany i think she's still the the most the, either the most popular or the second most popular after habeck depending what poll you look at um so it hasn't it hasn't hurt her reputation i just don't know um you know how how effective it has been maybe it has been effective in nudging nudging schultz along but i i, I don't think that um that he and others in in the chancellery are um you know, turning to her for for advice. Matt, you you mentioned um, the the Christian Democrats a little bit earlier in our conversation, and and I'm curious where where the opposition is in all of this. Um, where where do you see them? Um, you know, they seem very absor absorbed with some internal politicking right now, um, and not as involved, certainly criticism of, they've voiced some criticism at some of the decisions that the government has made, <laughs> um, but they seem to be surprisingly quiet. What's what's your take on on where the CDU is right now? Well, I, I mean, you know, if you if you look at the polls, they're they're doing they're doing okay. They're they're still you know they're at twenty seven percent versus twenty twenty one percent for the for the SPD, and I think the Greens are also around twenty uh, percent. You know, uh, it probably is better that they're being quiet because every time Schult, uh, every time uh, Merritt opens his mouth, he seems to put his foot in it. And um, you know, this this happened on on Friday again, where he was he was speaking to a group on Holocaust Remembrance Day, where he he said that he was you know proud of Germany's history, and and you know the context was I think he was talking about the you know remembrance culture and all of this kind of thing, but it's still. <laughs> You know, it was not the not the time to be talking about your 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 pride in, in Germany's history. Um, you know, I I, I think um, it's one of these situations where they they still haven't really found their their groove. And um, you know, as you say, they're they're they're, they're critical. Um, they're, they're all the things that we've been talking about. They they've been pushing Schultz to be more more aggressive uh, in uh, on on the Ukrainian uh, front. And also in terms of defense spending and all of this kind of thing, but um, you know, I think I think the core problem is is that that Merritt's just is is not a seen as a very sympathetic figure to most people. At least if you look at the polling, you know that's that's reflected there. So, you know, I think you know if maybe if they had somebody else, um, they would be you know already above thirty percent again. But uh, that's going to be a real challenge, I think, for them going going forward is is just that he he's not somebody who resonates with people um and and also the the party itself um you know doesn't doesn't seem to be as as um you know sort of solidly behind him or have a have a clear a clear message you know, because he doesn't have a clear message there's no real vision there i guess is what i'm saying you know if you think about what does the cdu stand for today what is their big idea what is what is Merit's going to do for the country if, if he becomes chancellor. It's not really, not really clear. They haven't really articulated that yet. So, um, you know, I think the, the, he's 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 effective in the in the Bundestag as a debater, certainly, and as you know, the leader of the opposition and so forth. He's good in that context. Um, but you know, if, if, if you need you need to be more than a you know than a than an attack dog, I think, mm -hmm. to to really broaden broaden the appeal and. Um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see. He, he's, as I say, I mean, they're still, they've been leading the polls consistently. Um, whether that would withstand the kind of pressures of a, of a, of a campaign, we won't know for, 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 for a couple of years. What do you make of, of sort of this latest news around Hanske Og Maaßen? He, um, is the former head of the Bundesamt für Verfassungsschutz, the German Federal yeah. Office for the Protection of the Constitution, um, and he is is now being pushed out of the the party for repeating some anti-Semitic and and racist tropes. Um, is this a storm in the teacup? Is it something we should read anything into? Uh, I mean, I think it's a bit of a sideshow. I mean, you know, clearly the, the guy is nuts, um, but. You know that's not really new, um, and they have to try to get him out. I think, even though legally it's going to be very difficult. We saw a similar situation with uh, Tilo Sarazin in the right. 
in the SPD. Um, and, and here, I think Maris has to, said the right things and, you know, is, they're, they're at least going to, to try and, and, and get him out. But he doesn't have any real power in the party or, or any, 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 real, any real influence. But it is, it's a, it's a distraction. Certainly, mm -hmm. um, but I, I wouldn't. I, I, I don't think that um, you know it's something that could really damage Merits or or the CDU in the in the long term because um, the, the people running the party have I think reacted appropriately and are saying all the right all the right things. So I'd I'd like to to come back to to Germany's sort of role on the world stage, if you will. Um, this week, the Chancellor is in South America. He'll be visiting Argentina, Brazil, um, and Chile. And um, there's been sort of a lot of interest in South America, partly because of natural resources like lithium and and gas. Um, but I was sort of reminded um, earlier in our conversation when you were talking about. Olaf Scholz as a young man, um, because as a as a Yuzo, he not only led some of the protests against um, Patriot missiles, but he also traveled to South America for the first time um, at that at that time. Um, what should we be watching from this this visit to to South America? Well, I mean, to me, it, it was it was very interesting to hear him speak today about this and and talk about. You know dictatorships and and um, you know how how dangerous the whole thing is and how horrible and all this kind of stuff, um, which is obviously very 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 true. And 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 he went to a memorial for the victims of the uh, Pinochet regime, I think. Um, um, and I, but you know if if you if you look at what he himself did in the 1980s with with the GDR and all of the trips that he made, he made night trips there, and and you know he was collaborating with. The communist leadership then um, trying to drum up, you know, su support in, in in Germany to undo the decision to send Pershing missiles. It's just it's sort of an interesting uh, contrast, but I think it again shows you know where his mind was as a young man vis-a-vis uh, -vis the United States in particular, you know, because you know one of the kind of dominant themes in South America in the 1980s when he was there as well was, you know, the, the, the anti-Americanism, um, which, you know, I don't want to suggest that he's he's still uh, anti-American, but I do think that if you, if you, although he might be, but if you, if you look at uh, his, his history, there, there are these, there are these threads there. And I think it does also help explain a bit this skepticism about you know Washington and not you know going forth with the with the tanks. This is something mm -hmm. that was explained to me yesterday. It was a surprising explanation to me, which was that um, the, the the thinking is that if you don't have the United States on board and there is escalation, then um, the U.S. might not honor Article Five of the NATO treaty. Uh, by coming to Germany's aid, let's say if the Russians attack Germany, say, mm -hmm. um, which I, I find to be, if, if true, that's really uh, shocking in a way. If they really think that, um, I mean, I think it is it logically doesn't make sense to me, given how much the U.S. has already supplied to Ukraine. The, the thought that, you know, by giving leopards that would somehow trigger retaliation against Germany from the Russians um, and the U.S. wouldn't respond to that. Uh, under Article Five, just seems seems absurd to me. But it could be if that really is what they're thinking. I think it is also a reflection of this. There is this kind of lingering distrust of of the U.S. there, mm -hmm. um, and his affinity for you know these leftist movements in 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 South America. I think might you know might reflect that to a degree. I mean, to what degree do you think um, the the global economy plays a role in all of that? Um, on on Saturday, um, Scholz made sort of a renewed appeal um, to the EU and and um, the the Mercosur countries to finally finalize and ratify um, the Treaty for Greater Trade and Political Cooperation. Uh, if I remember correctly, the negotiations were officially concluded in 2019, um, but there have been sort of some ongoing negotiations since then. Um, given Germany's need for energy, um, given the gas resources in South America, how much of, of 
sort of the global economy and and the energy debate do you think plays a role in the visit right now but also in in some of Schultz's positioning I, I mean I, I I do think it's important particularly the um you know the lithium uh issue for you know batteries that you know you can get you can get that from from South America uh Germany needs you know new sources for that I mean we should also I think in that context uh look to China and and the tensions that exist there with with with, with China which is also one of the main sources of of rare earths um so you know I mean I I I think there are probably other places they can get energy quite frankly than than than, than South America uh that are that are nearer to to Germany as we've seen with their overtures towards uh Qatar recently um but I think what we're seeing here is you know Germany is an exporting nation um and relies on exports more than any other major economy uh and it has a problem now because of not just Russia but in particular the the tensions with 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 China and um you know he he understands this and I I, I think you know is is um trying to do whatever he can to, to 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 lessen the blow. I mean, the other thing that factors into this is that the, the most important industry in Germany, the the auto industry, has been kind of slow on the uptake in terms of uh, shifting to uh, electric vehicles, and they're they're catching up now, but they're still not where they were. All of these not where they should be. You know, the major manufacturers. Um, still rely on Asian battery producers, for example. And, and in an electric car, the, the real innovation and the value added, as it were, is in the battery, not in the motor. And the Germans have to outsource this, this key component, um, which, you know, in the longer term means that the margins that they get for those uh, vehicles are going to be are going to be lower and they're going to be, be less profitable unless they can unless they can catch up so mm -hmm. you know these are all things that I think he is he is keenly uh aware of and that the rising energy prices again has put German industry under enormous pressure and many companies are, are looking elsewhere particularly to the United States where the price of gas is I think uh, one-fifth what it is in in, in Germany now mm -hmm. Matt, we've we've covered a lot of ground. We've talked about a lot of things, but is is there anything that we have not touched on that you think is worth bringing to our to our attention at the moment? Uh, anything we have not touched on? Um, uh, no, I think that's... Or, you know, or what are you following? Me. What are what are what? you following that people might be interested in that that yeah. we haven't touched on? I mean, what what one issue that I think is is really um, still bubbling very uh, close to the surface is um the, the the question of asylum and um you know the um the foreigners as 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 they call them uh, now that you know we've had some attacks here uh recently with asylum seekers um killing uh teenagers i think there've been two cases like this just randomly on trains um and you know, I mean, this is an issue; it remains unresolved. I think we, we've all are all aware of what happened uh, in 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 2015 and the years after that. Um, but but this is something that um, you know keeps coming up, and it just it seems that the society is and the politicians are nowhere near to to really coming up with workable workable solutions. Um, mm -hmm. And it does affect, I think, uh, the politics, obviously, uh, in terms of support for the AFD, which is up again, you know, at around 15 percent. That might be their ceiling. Let's let's hope that's their their ceiling. But, um, you know, with, with all the other problems Germany faces, this this is this is a this is a big one. Um, and, you know, the, this question of the worker shortage, the skilled worker shortage, um, you know, that's something else that I'm following that is, is you know, a little bit connected to the other issue, but it, it just, there um, are no real solutions, it seems, to these problems, which I think will pose, you know, some, some long-term serious uh, challenges to, to, the, to, the German, to the German economy. 
Well, thanks. Thanks for particularly bumping up the the question about refugees. Um, it's it's interesting. I I was speaking with somebody earlier in the year, and and we were talking a little bit about some of the topics um, that were likely to dominate the agenda in in 2023. And obviously, um, the war in Ukraine will continue to be the dominant topic. Um, but the person I was talking to did say, look at the refugee issue. Um, obviously, there was a high point in 2015 due to all the Syrian refugees, last year with all of the Ukrainian refugees. And even though the response to the refugee crisis was very different last year versus 2015 and 2016, it continues to be an issue that, that Germany will have to wrap its head around. And so it is a topic that's worth sort of keeping front of mind and, and not forgetting about too quickly. Yeah, definitely. Well, Matt, thank you so much for, for joining us today. As always, um, it was great to speak with you. Um, I always learn a lot when we when we get together, and um, I'm sure our viewers did as well. So it's, it's wonderful to speak with you, and I, I look forward to seeing you in the not-too-distant future in person um, and hopefully touching base with you again at a Café Pausa later in the year. Well, thank you again for having me, Steve. It was a pleasure. Take care. Bye-bye.